we are really pleased, Eric, to be interviewing you today. Um, and to everyone that will be watching this after, my name is Megan. Um, I'm the current president of the QSAA, and I'm joined by Kathleen, um, our student transition ambassador. Um, and so we'll be interviewing Eric Windler today, uh, the founder and executive director of Jack.org. Um, and Jack.org is a Canadian charity that is training and empowering a network of young leaders to revolutionize mental health. Uh, so thank you, Eric, for being here with us. Well, thank you, uh, Megan and Kathleen. It's it's my honor, my pleasure to be here. It's great to great to see you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Awesome. Um, and so I'll start off with the first question. So um, could you first talk to us about the creation of Jack.org and um, its mission and mandate and maybe what steps you took um, to bringing it into fruition? Um, well, happy to. And uh, I, I usually preface this by saying I can now talk unemotionally about this, but it is a pretty heavy story. So I just put that out there. Uh, and some of your audience may may know the story. But uh, uh, if you had asked me literally 12, 12 years and one month ago, uh, because uh, that's an important time frame, uh, how we were doing as a family, I would have told you we were we were a healthy, healthy, happy family, and uh, I had a successful entrepreneurial career. My wife was a, uh, an executive, actually, at one of the big banks, and uh, we thought we had three very happy, healthy children. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, that wasn't the case. Our eldest, Jack, who uh, uh, was at Queen's at the time, uh, was a first-year student, um, uh, we didn't know, uh, we had no idea he was struggling, but he was struggling severely. And uh, um, our whole sort of entrance into this world uh, started with a call from a police officer, very sadly. This is not how you want to get involved with mental health. And uh, that uh, poor gentleman had to come to our house. Uh, he was there in about three minutes, he must have just been parking up the street. And uh, sadly, he had to tell us that uh, we had lost our son, Jack. He had been found in his residence room and he had died by suicide uh, the night before. So this was, in, uh, this was in March of 2010. And as I said, we had no idea he was even struggling. Uh, I often say uh, our kids take after their mother intellectually. They're, they were bright kids. Jack, uh, he actually stream gifted in the early early stages and school was never really a challenge for him. Um, like he literally could read chapter books at age four or five, it was ridiculous. And, uh, uh, but, but what I've learned since is that um, what we call these transition years of roughly age 15 to 24 is when 70% of the onset of mental illness happens. And uh, a lot of that is, you know, exacerbated by being away from home for the first time or in a new environment. And uh, uh, back in those days, no one was talking about mental health, literally no one. Uh, so to carry on with the rest of your question, um, uh, you know, we were obviously devastated. Uh, we were surrounded immediately by family and friends, which was so helpful. Uh, but as we picked ourselves up, um, uh, I guess I would say me in particular, but really supported by my, my co-founder, Sandra Hannington, and our close family and friends, uh, I was really inspired to look into this, you know, because if this could happen to us, I felt like maybe it could happen to anybody because we thought, you know, we thought we uh, were a healthy, happy family. And um, so to kick things off, um, Sandra had briefly been on the board of Kids Help Phone, which is a, obviously you will probably know as a national youth crisis line. And at that time, there was really no mental health aspect of Kids Help Phone. It was just for young people who were in crisis of some sort. Uh, the, the mental health language wasn't there. But she had briefly been on the board of Kids Help Phone as the Bank of Montreal representative. Uh, frankly, really as a strategy and marketing expert, not as a, you know, any kind of a youth, uh, a youth expert, but, uh, but that did give us an affiliation with that organization. So uh, we decided um, uh, for us to make a, a pretty significant donation in Jack's memory to start a memorial fund at Kids Help Phone. Um, and uh, our immediate close friends and family 
uh, you know, joined in and uh, it was amazing. In a few months, we had raised literally 600,000 uh, to this to this fund. Um, and uh, that really inspired me to to look into this and see how we might be able to do more. And uh, so we actually branded that memorial fund, the Jack Project at Kids Help Phone. And we spent two years there um, doing uh, what we call a, a national and global landscape scan. Uh, so we took a, a really considered, and this was gu guided by Kids Help Phone, we took a really considered approach. We didn't just plunge in and start a charity. We said, is there a place where we can fill a gap, where we can make a difference and really add to what's going on? And, uh, uh, and then interestingly, uh, what you probably wouldn't know, and I'm sure you, your, your listeners wouldn't know, is that same year that we lost Jack, um, several students were actually lost at Queens to suicide. Uh, and so uh, Queens had really kind of perked up their interest in this. And I had kept in touch with them and uh, I visited with the, uh, uh, you know, with the principal at that time. And uh, um, so they were very uh, wanting to be very helpful and see what they could do in this area. So after those initial two years at Kids Help Phone, when we did a pilot study, we did the landscape scan, we engaged with uh, 36 different schools and two community organizations uh, executing this pilot study. I won't go into all those details, uh, but then we shifted our charitable funds. So we had raised some more money. And one thing you may not know is you can shift funds from one charity to another. So with Kids Help Phone's full blessing, um, we, we shifted our funds to Queens because what we had landed on in our uh, pilot evaluation was that youth were really being left out of this uh, discussion about mental health. And uh, so we envisioned something we call our youth engagement, youth leadership model uh, of really engaging young people in this most important health issue for them. And uh, Queens welcomed us there and we spent a year working with uh, young leaders at Queens and reaching out to young people all across the country um, uh, with the Jack Project at that time. And then that was very successful. So in the summer of 2013, um, you may not know this, but you have to incorporate as a company and then apply for charitable status. So uh, in July of 2013, um, we, we registered jack.org as a company. That's when we actually rebranded it to jack.org. We got some branding advice from um, uh, a gentleman I had met in the space who was also had been uh, had had a suicide in his family, and he was really inspired to help. And jack.org is obviously the call out to the web address, so it really drives people to the site. Um, uh, so that was July uh, 2013, and we got our charitable status within 60 days, which is very quick. Uh, and that's when we really took off as an independent charity. And now we have uh, over 75 staff, full-time staff. Mm -hmm. And I often say that's important, but what's really important is about 3,000 young, young people. We call them our young leaders in our network from all across the country volunteer with jack.org, which is very important in our, our youth leadership, youth engagement, peer-to-peer uh, -peer model. So that's how it all got started with obviously a, a, a tragic story. Um, but you know, with anything, if you if you suffer from something, if you if you give back, it helps you. So I'd say uh, this has really helped us deal with uh, deal with that loss. I hope I hope that answers your question. Sorry, it was so long. <laughs> no, yes, and no, don't apologize. And thank you for also opening up to us and being so honest about the um, creation of Jack.org and and how great it has been for helping other people. So I want to thank you for not only its creation, but also thank you for um, teaching young people that it's good to talk about our mental health. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass it to Kathleen. For the next question. Yeah, just one thing before I um, go on to the next question. I went to Havergal College in North Toronto, and I know that those schools both have very strong affiliations with Jack.org as well as Queens. And I've had a lot of my peers been a part of the growth and um, and a part of the club, both at my high schools and at Queens. And 
a lot of my friends have been affected by mental health and it has been an amazing community for them to be a part of in high school and university. So it's really great to be talking to you, the founder today. That's very cool. And I hear all kinds of anecdotal stories like that. And it's, uh, it is so true what you said, uh, Kathleen, because, uh, you know, being part of a community when you're struggling uh, and you know it's a warm and accepting community can be so helpful. It's incredible. Yes. And then also those young people giving back, they get something back from that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really uh, it's really interesting. And that wasn't initially what we really envisioned, but we've seen that so much. Oh, yeah. The benefits are truly amazing to see um, for everyone that is affected by the club. Um, so I'll move on to the next question. As someone who has held high ranking positions and even co-founded a previous company before Jack.org, Jack what barriers did you see, if any, that could have prohibited the success of Jack.org and how did you overcome them? Well, it's interesting. I was always an entrepreneur. My, my dad, we come from very kind of rural Nova Scotia. Uh, and my, my dad always encouraged me to go into business because he had missed an opportunity uh, in his career that probably would have been a pretty good one. Uh, won't get into the details, but uh, so like I literally had a paper route when I was, I think, 11 or 12 years old. And I started a little paint contracting company when I was in grade 12. And, um, and we, the main business I started was an automotive firm that did grow quite large to uh, 2000 employees and 13 factories across North America and Europe. And so I had some experience starting a business. And what's interesting, and I think really helpful is, um, Many, many of those learnings apply to starting a charity as well, um, except uh, the key part, and this is where Kids Help Phone was so helpful, when you're starting a business, you're going into competition, right? And you're saying, well, I'm going to be better and, and you know, our prices will be lower and hopefully our profits will be higher. You're thinking about all those sort of business financial things. When you're starting a charity, um, you want to do the most good. And that's one thing we say all the time, how can we do the most good? And Kids Help Phone was so helpful to us to, to make sure we won't, weren't just adding more kind of clutter to the space. And one thing I learned early on, um, and don't quote me on these exact numbers, but there's almost 90,000 charities in Canada. Okay, that's a lot, a lot of charities. Mm -hmm. And, but, but only, you know, like five or 10,000 of them are substantial in any way. Most of them are tiny, uh, almost volunteer based. And what that does is it kind of clutters up the landscape, um, unfortunately. And I have full respect for all those charities, don't get me wrong, but to sort of scale past that, you know, really tiny size uh, was really key. And that means you, you don't want to just do anything that you, comes to mind. You want to think carefully and considerately. So uh, when we did that landscape scan and really uh, did our pilot evaluation with those uh, schools and community uh, uh, activities uh, or community uh, uh, organizations, um, we were really trying to find a niche that was untapped. And so once we found that niche, we, we didn't find a lot of barriers, frankly. Um, you know, the young people were very keen to get involved. Um, you know, one of the barriers that faces all charities is raising funds because you, you have to raise funds. You're not selling, you know, selling car parts or T-shirts or, or whatever. You're, you're having to raise funds from generous people and uh, foundations and corporations and so on. So learning how to do fundraising uh, was key. And uh, uh, we got a good start with that as well. So we, frankly, Kathleen, didn't find huge barriers, uh, mm -hmm. but it was because of the approach we took. We didn't just plunge in and, and look up and find, oh, there's 10 other ch charities doing this already, which would have been very difficult, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that helps. Yeah, and it definitely ties back to your main goal of revolutionizing mental health and yeah, finding that niche and the gap that we needed. In line with that, that is kind of a good segue onto the next question as well. So um, with these um, values of revolutionizing mental health, um, I just wanted to know is what are the main goals of Jack.org and, and how do you advocate 
for these on a daily basis? Um, how do you kind of uh, push this knob forward um, on a daily basis? Because it seems daunting to, um, you know, you might want to try to be able to get these messages across to so many different people on a global scale. And so it's, it's how do we bring that down to the local level? Yeah, the so the way I'll describe that is um, kind of with one kind of overarching value, and that is to uh, train and empower young leaders, young people. We always say young leaders, what we mean is any young people, and we all have the capacity to be a, a certain amount of a leader, but some are you know, a little more leadership oriented but to train and empower young leaders to ensure they have the education and the resources to take care of themselves from a mental health point of view, but also to look out for their peers. And um, you know, the more advanced young leaders in our community also get involved in trying to uh, advocate for change in the mental health uh, sector. You know, whether that be something as small as discussing with your uh, administration at your school, how there's a missing service or a resource and how that might be put in place, or whether it's, uh, you know, on a more ambitious scale, meeting with decision makers. You know, at our National Jack Summit, uh, we've twice had the Federal Minister of Health. And, uh, and instead of that person coming to our event and just talking to me, we set up a deliberate opportunity for them to meet and hear directly from the young people. So that overarching goal, I would really say, is to, to train and empower those young leaders, uh, not tell them what to do, but to train them and sort of elevate their skills. And then we do have what we call our principles, which is really just a, a sort of a, another term for values. And we always say youth front and center. Um, we always say collaborate with curiosity. So, uh, you know, there's so many people in this space now and growing, we want to uh, collaborate with them. And in some, in some cases, formally partner with them, but really have a curious point of view. Uh, and then the next one is engage with empathy, kindness, and respect. Uh, and that's really, uh, you know, that's sort of an underlying thing about how you should talk about mental health with anybody or deal with it. Uh, and then innovation focused and evidence-based. So we do have a real uh, you know, I often say uh, young people are so, just so naturally technically savvy um, uh, and really building on that to, to have an innovative approach, um, but always basing it in evidence. And that is really key. So we, we starting from those kids' cell phone days, at that time, we hired what's called an external evaluator to help us evaluate our work and make sure we were having the right impact. Uh, we now have a whole evaluation and impact team internally at jack.org uh, and we have some real experts on our board of directors that help us make sure that uh, you know there's good evidence uh, of the programmatic work we're doing and that it's making a difference. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, I really like that collaboration with curiosity that stood out to me, um, as do all of them, but that one really like inspires me, I think, um, when I think about, you know, the power of working together, but also just to, to further this mission, but also, um, like you said, going back to having a community is so important. So um, yeah, thank you for, for sharing those. How exactly does Jack.org go about accomplishing these goals and making a difference? Where does it put its money, people, and time? Uh, well, that's great. And uh, I, I'm suspecting because you you know some people who have been very involved, Kathleen, this won't all be news to you. No. Um, but I'm, I'm going to tell it in a bit of a story way, because I think that's really uh, interesting. Um, uh, back in the fall of 2012, when we were formally dealing with those young people at Queens, um, uh, they said to me, do you think we'd be able to kind of connect with youth all, this wasn't my idea, it was their idea. Do you think we'd be able to con connect with youth all across the country and they even said, this is kind of interesting in these pandemic times, and have some sort of a virtual meetup. Uh, and what I added to that party is I said, hmm, that's really cool, but maybe we could actually even get people together because we had raised some funds and that led to, uh, believe it or not, in March of 2013, we had our very first ever National Jack Summit. So those young leaders reached out to all their contacts across uh, the country. Um, we only had two staff at that point, myself, I was still a volunteer at that point, uh, and, and uh, two uh, 
actually uh, Queen students who are on a gap year and working for Jack.org. And they actually researched schools across the country and sent emails. And, and we, we actually, you know, kind of fully filled up our quota, which was at that time, 200 young leaders who were, we flew them into Toronto uh, or they came by train or, or bus or whatever, depending on where they were from. But they came from, at that time, the very first one, I think there was young people from 13, sorry, 12 of the 13 provinces and territories. Um, and why this is so important is um, that led to what's called our Jack Summits program. So the Jack Summits program is one of our three core programs and um, started with that very first event. Uh, now there are over 20 of these events each year at the local, regional and national level. So the National Jack Summit uh, happens every year, usually in March. Uh, we actually just had it last month. And it was the first one in two years we've been able to uh, be back partially in person, which was amazing to get the young leaders here in Toronto. It was a hybrid event. Um, but at that very first National Jack Summit, um, listening to those young people, and I remember I got coaching in, in, the early, in the early years from one of our supporters, and he loved the model. And he said, just make sure whenever you're in front of those young people, he said, make sure you've got your elephant ears on. He literally said that and really are listening. And mm -hmm. I took that to heart. Um, and um, it started coming uh, out in that event. Um, young leaders were saying, because we had some young leaders speaking and sharing their story and so on. So more and more of them were saying, we'd like to learn how to uh, effectively share our story about mental health. Uh, because, you know, already it was known that that was an effective way to learn. So that, that point that those young people brought up led to our Jack Talks program. So Jack Summits is the first one. The next one that came was Jack Talks. So each year we train and certify uh, over 100 Jack Talks speakers. So these are young people. Um, and uh, typically they're age 18 and up because they have to, in normal times, travel around and like be at uh, schools and communities giving these Jack Talks peer-to-peer uh, -peer education sessions, uh, which are really designed at educating peers on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, safely sharing their stories. Uh, uh, that helps reduce stigma, we know that, and it, it helps increase help seeking. Um, so Jack Talks obviously for the last couple of years have been given virtually both live stream and on a pre-recorded basis. But the Jack Talks program is really our entry. You know, if a school wants to get involved, often the first way they'll do it is they'll invite a Jack Talk to come to their school. Uh, and I think we're on track this year to give about 800 Jack Talks across the country. Uh, and you can imagine if you're a young person that just doesn't know much about mental health, um, you know, in, in normal times, think about two young people up on stage who've been, they've gone through 50 hours of public speaking training, 50 hours. It's incredible the amount they volunteer to learn how to effectively share their story in a confident way, which frankly is good skills for them to learn, but it's also a, a real engaging way to, uh, because many young people in that audience have struggled or are struggling and they relate to that and that helps them kind of, you know, open up with their journey. So that's the second program, Jack Talks. The third one, the Jack Chapters, the idea actually came from that very first National Jack Summit as well, because they said, uh, uh, is it possible we could do this all year long? Because it's great we're getting together at this big event, um, but we'd like to do stuff all year long. And that led to what we now have long since called our Jack Chapters program. And that's a little bit what you're familiar with from your high school right. experience, uh, Kathleen. So these are youth-led groups at high schools, colleges, universities, and about 10% of them are in community settings. And that mainly started in the North where, uh, you know, unfortunately not as many young people go on to post-secondary, but they may be connected with a community center, for example. Um, and these, uh, these Jack chapters, they also receive training from the staff, uh, but they, they create these initiatives and they kind of reach out to different parts of their community to, to really keep that uh, discussion about mental health going on uh, throughout the year. So sometimes they'll, it's really up to them what, that, what 
what part of their community they reach out to. But a lot of them are, they'll reach out to a sporting based event or an arts or music based event, or they'll host a speaker event, uh, different things, and they'll weave that topic of mental health in. And uh, uh, those Jack chapters are, are very powerful. We actually had over 200 Jack chapters active just before the pandemic. Um, uh, some of them have gone a little inactive due to the pandemic and, you know, uh, remote work and extracurriculars getting canceled for the time being. Uh, but there's about 180 of them that have kept very active through the pandemic. And uh, uh, they, again, are in all, all provinces and territories. So those are our three core, what I call our legacy programs. Um, uh, about, uh, about five years in, so I guess it would have been 2017 or 2018, um, our young leaders from across the country started saying to us, again, we had those elephant ears on, we were listening. They started saying more and more of our peers are opening up about their struggles. Is there a way we can learn how to support them? Not be their psychiatrist or psychologist, but just be their peer, be there for them. And that's literally the words they used, be there. How do we be there for them? And uh, that initiated, initiated a project, which uh, incredibly our funders quickly, uh, we raised uh, again about 600,000 when we put the word out to our funders and said, we'd like to create this resource. And we didn't just plunge in and create it. We saw if there was something else out there and we couldn't find anything that was really engaging to youth and evidence-based. Uh, and so we took it upon ourselves to create a resource that is called Be There. And it's, uh, it's at bethere.org. Uh, and uh, uh, what's exciting about it is uh, there's been over 800,000 unique users of the Be There site so far. And yes, candidly, some of them just go and quickly check it out. Some of them spend a lot of time there. Uh, it's, it's full of these sort of educational tutorial videos by young people. It's based around something we call the five golden rules of how to support someone and be there for them. Um, but the real fun aspect of this story, uh, and I could even link you to her Twitter post, but we got reached out to by a, a U.S. foundation that I had heard of, but we, you know, we're a Canadian charity, so we weren't dealing with them. But the foundation, their, their founders a little more famous than me, Lady Gaga and her mother founded Born This Way Foundation. Um, so when the pandemic hit, they actually reached out to us and said, we love your Be There resource, we've seen it. Is there some way we can get involved? And that led to a, a formal partnership, like literally a signed partnership we have with Born This Way Foundation. And it led to uh, what I call the phase two of Be There, which is something called the Be There uh, Certificate Program. So uh, we now have launched that again, just launched last month after about 12 years in the make or 12 months in the making. Um, the Be There Certificate is launched and it's, it's at be there certificate.org. Be There Certificate uh, is a, a, about a two or three hour uh, uh, online session you can go through and earn a certificate. Uh, about how to support someone close to you who may be struggling. And many of these skills you learn also teach you how to support yourself, which is also very important. So those are kind of the four key things I call the Jack Talks, Jack Chapters, Jack Summits, sort of our legacy uh, programs. They've had to pivot to digital recently, but we're starting to get back in person, as I mentioned with the, the summits. Um, and then the, the digital resource, Be There and Be There Certificate are really the sort of the newer program. There's other things we do, but those are sort of the core things of, of what we do. Sorry again to be so long, but. No, I thought the insight in that answer was great. And I'm, I'm writing all this down right now. And just like at firsthand seeing the outreach and the national and international recognition is just a testament to how strong of a charity that Jack.org really is. And um, it's great to hear as well that you had the summit back in person um, this past March. So that was awesome to hear. And um, in light of that, and I know you mentioned that some things were digital, but you're slowly getting back to in person. So um, how has the pandemic affected um, Jack.org and has the mission of Jack.org 
changed since its inception um, or in light of the pandemic? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, so I'll take that sort of in two parts. Um, uh, you know, the very early years was was really about, you know, if you'd asked me, it was uh, young leaders trying to reduce stigma amongst their peers. Uh, but as we've got deeper into it, uh, it's really, you know, those formal programs started developing and, uh, you know, uh, always with an emphasis to, to training the young leaders uh, and then, you know, kind of setting them free to do the bulk of the work. You know, that youth front and center is so key because it's known in the evidence that, you know, frankly, uh, young people your age, they don't want to listen to an old guy like me. They really relate to hearing um, stories uh, and, and information from their peers. And the other important aspect of that is peers are very, uh, very high probability. They're going to be the, the most likely to notice change in behavior, which can be a sign of struggle. And frankly, this relates back to, to our personal story because I went and visited uh, the residents, Don, and the students on Jack's floor um, about two weeks after he passed. And they were wonderful. They were so, they were so sweet and kind. Um, but they had actually observed a number of changes in behavior. But at that time, they didn't associate those with struggle. Jack had not been going to class for, uh, on a regular basis for several months, not just for like a week, for several months. Um, he had come home at Christmas, hadn't told us about that. He uh, came home at reading week um, and uh, hadn't told us about that. He, he did admit he was a little bit behind, um, but we always said, well, no problem with him. He, you know, he was always a, a great student. Uh, and uh, the fact of the matter is he was, he was probably feeling very ashamed and embarrassed because he hadn't been going to classes. He had been isolating in his room. And these were all things that those peers who were on his residence floor saw, but they hadn't had this kind of training. And I think had they had that, we could have had a very different, uh, you know, and be, you know, we had to, to, Sandra and I had good jobs. We, had we known, we would have probably gone down, bundled them up, brought them home, and you know found resources uh, and you know if we had to pay for them we would have figured out a way to pay for them and that's a whole nother story about how uh, you know the mental health system isn't functioning that well um, so the other big thing i would mention about how the pandemic has affected our approach um, you know yes we deepened our programs and all the rest of it but then the pandemic hits and most of our programs were uh, except for the Be There resource, they were in-person programs. So the chapter activities happened in person. The summits were in person, uh, whether they be local, regional, and national. Uh, and um, uh, the talks were these two young speakers going to, you know, a high school auditorium, for example, and giving a, uh, about a one-hour talk. And uh, so we had just finished our second five-year strategic plan uh, and it was actually approved by our board of directors the first week of March 2020. And the pandemic was, was not a pandemic yet. We knew that there was something going on with COVID. Um, so we had made our strategic plan. But then literally two weeks later, it became, a, you know, a pandemic. And um, so we had to quickly, um, you know, pivot to digital. And that's a very overworked overused term these days, everybody's had to pivot to digital. Uh, and we had called for in that strategic plan, what I describe as a lean into digital over the five years, doing more uh, digital re uh, work to reach young people. Instead, we had to accelerate it to a sharp pivot to digital. And so within two weeks, uh, we recorded a, a, a digital Jack talk. Uh, so we were able to keep those going through the rest of the year. Um, we pivoted and learned how to, uh, we couldn't have our, our, our uh, Jack Summit was meant to be later that month. Instead, we delayed it uh, two months. Uh, so in May, we had our first ever virtual uh, summit. Um, and those are examples of how we really had to pivot. And what's interesting about that is we've known how it's helped us reach a lot more young people. Um, and when we return to normal, whenever this happens, uh, we will not be returning to only in-person stuff. We will be returning 
kind of like the workplace nowadays and potentially even school, we will return to kind of a hybrid approach. So those schools that want us to come and give a Jack talk in person, we will. But other schools may want to sort of more, uh, you know, uh, do it at the classroom level and use a, a live stream or a pre-recorded digital talk to educate their uh, their peers. So we're going to offer up those sort of uh, uh, mix, mixed approaches. Um, and, uh, you know, our experience in the early days, because we launched uh, the Be There resource, and that, that was a fully digital resource, we launched that in May of 2019. So about well, what's that about uh, nine months ahead of the pandemic uh, but that had already given us because we took about a year of developing that uh, a lot of uh, kind of knowledge and we had built some really digital strong uh, members of the team so that really helped us in that sharp pivot to digital uh, so those are the key things that that really have changed I hope that helps yeah, definitely. And it's really great to hear that you will be continuing in a hybrid version because I know, and I'm sure Kathleen and I both agree on this, but having some sort of a hybrid option is really beneficial, whether it's in school or through organizations. So um, yeah, that is really great to hear. Especially because I know the pandemic definitely has taken a toll on people's mental health. So the um, like evolving with the times and how difficult this has been is uh, more beneficial to everyone and especially in our club we've had in-person things and online and everyone's been able to make both or do what they can so it's it's great to see that um everyone's kind of taking this approach now yeah i'm so proud of the queen's chapter it's a uh, uh you know for obvious reasons it's close to my heart and uh, mm -hmm. they're they're really one of our stellar chapters and uh um yeah no, they're, they're great. Um, definitely very widely known over the whole campus and their social media presence is amazing. So it's I'm proud to be a part of a school that um, takes so much pride in mental health and especially mm -hmm. jack.org. Um, so next we'll move on to um, another question. We can't imagine how monumentally difficult it has been to start a charity like this not just logistically, but emotionally. What uh, was it that helped you through the process of building Jack.org, whether it's skills you learned the in the past or people who have helped you through it? Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the, the most important part and that is what helped me through it. Uh, and you know, it's gonna sound kind of corny, but it's uh, closest friends and family. Um, we have lots of friends, obviously, but our the two couples that I would say arguably are closest to us um, and really surrounded us, you know, almost from that first day that we got that news. Um, uh, they they were really, really supportive of this. Obviously, our family was incredibly supportive. Um, my family is is spread all is I come like I have five brothers and sisters. My dad had five brothers and sisters. So, we, you know, I've got a pretty big family on my side. It's not quite as big on Sandra's side, but they're all so um, not one person kind of judged, you know, because that's what you used to get back in those days is, is you know, judgment uh, and uh, negative uh, sort of feedback. Not one person in our family and friend group um, did that. And, 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 you know, when we, you know, communicated to our friends with, I still have the email uh, somewhere, uh, you know, this, this uh, tragic news. Um, it was such a warm outpouring. So I would say that that was so uh, helpful, Kathleen, to, you know, to sort of buoy, particularly my spirits, you know, uh, and give me the sort of the courage and energy to do this, you know, because it was super emotional um, and it was really hard in those first days. Um, uh, I would say the second part to that is, you know, on the on the skills side, and I alluded to this off the top, it, it really helped to have been an entrepreneur. You know, Sandra worked in kind of corporate world her whole life, but I had been used to starting things up. And, uh, um, you know, that is super helpful when you're starting a charity as well. And I, I remember a story of a, uh, uh, of a lovely woman who had worked in the charitable sector for a long time and she was looking at becoming the executive director of her charity but she had come up through the social work chain 
So, you know, that's amazing. She knew the program side of their work, but she didn't know anything about fundraising or, or, you know, financials or how to run the, you know, the human resources part of your organization. Because when you have a charity, you have all those things, right? You have to, your revenue is fundraising. You have to have uh, appropriate uh, human resources to, you know, to support the staff. Uh, and that all came second nature to me because I had just been doing it my whole life. So those two things, the, the friends and family sort of supporting us uh, from a uh, emotional and personal side and just having the right background uh, was really helpful. Yeah, and going back to the stigmatization of mental health, especially even 10 years ago, um, it's really amazing to see how far we've come and how much it's talked about in schools because um, yeah, I, I was younger at that time, but definitely was not talked about at my school, but it has, it has definitely grown. Over. Yeah, that's, uh, I'll just inject something there, Kathleen. It's a, it's, you know, we're, we're reaching a lot of schools, but we're very interested over time in getting kind of more formally into the educational system. And that's a that's a job that takes some work. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, can you imagine uh, if there was appropriate content for, you know, middle middle school age kids that's mm -hmm. teaching them certain things. And then mm -hmm. as they approach high school, they're getting additional content. And it probably doesn't need to be, you know, a full time course like, you know, mathematics or history or geography. But if you had a, a session once or twice a month that, you know, was weaved into your uh, into your uh, curriculum, I think that could be super helpful. But the content has to be engaging to young people. That's one thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I often say, if not, it just, you know, if 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 your socials aren't engaging, they'll just scroll on by. It's got to really, it's got to be really be meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so important about the emphasis on the youth and right. the community aspect of Jack.org. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of related to our last question for you, if you have a little bit of time, but um, what do you see as the future for Jack.org? Um, and is there a goal that you're most proud of accomplishing um, with Jack.org to date? Well, um, I'm actually very aspirational in that in that area. I. Uh, I think there's so much more to be done. We are reaching lots of young people in Canada and making a real difference. Um, but there's lots more a reach that we need to have. Um, I think we want to keep our charitable work focused in Canada, but uh, reach the way I often put it is we, we, we want to be there for all young people in Canada, but we also are taking uh, uh, an interest in underserved populations. Uh, and that is hugely important. And, uh, you know, by that, uh, uh, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with the term BIPOC, but, uh, um, you know, underserved populations can include, can include Black, Indigenous, uh, uh, you know, newcomer Canadians, maybe coming from a culture that, that isn't really focused on mental health. Lower socioeconomic uh, is really key as well. Um, and we're doing a lot of work in, uh, in currently, but this is where some of the aspirations are to, uh, to not go into those sectors and compete with charities who are already, for example, an Indigenous youth-focused charity. We want to work with them and help them do more good and learn more about mental health. And, uh, um, you know, I'm sure you're aware, but maybe your audience isn't as aware. If, if, uh, if you're from an underserved population, um, you are both at higher risk of mental health struggle and you are less likely to be able to find appropriate, um, applicable and affordable resources to, to help you. Um, you know, you just won't find a counselor necessarily that you will really relate to uh, that sort of thing. And you may not even be able to afford it, let alone to get to the front of the wait line, because there's often six or eight month wait lines to get services. So we want to really, we, our work is what we call upstream peer-to-peer -peer education. And if you can help young people build their toolkit and learn about mental health and do the things that takes care of their own mental health and helps them support their peers, that has an offsetting burden on the downstream uh, mental health system. 
-hmm. okay because you know if you can if you can help a, a young person um you know they can often uh Sure, they may struggle to a certain degree, but maybe not to a clinical degree where they're going to need constant uh, support. And that's, uh, you know, I often use the example, if you can teach a young person not to, you know, not to smoke, this isn't quite as big of a thing now as it was in my in my term, but just about everybody tried smoking, uh, you know, back in my days. Uh, but if you can teach someone not to do that, you're you're going to reduce the onset of you know lung to get lung disease and you know uh, cancer and things like that downstream it's the same with mental health if you can teach young people uh, about how to take care of their own mental health support their peers it'll help the overall system um, so the other thing i would say is you know uh, not just reaching more youth in canada with a focus on underserved populations uh, as a Canadian charity, we don't see doing our work formally outside of Canada, but we see a lot of partnering uh, with international organizations. Uh, each, every two years, we attend the International Association of Youth Mental Health Global Conference, uh, and we become, you know, pretty significant player at that event, uh, and that leads to collaborations and, you know, different from my business career, we are totally open to sharing our resources freely uh, with uh, organizations internationally. So yes, we have this formal partnership with Born This Way Foundation in the US, but uh, we see the possibility of really uh, supporting other international organizations, including those from less fortunate countries. Because let's face it, Canada is a very, very fortunate country. Uh, and <clears throat> we should be able to uh, become a real global leader in, in the youth mental health space, because youth are our future. If we don't take care of youth, where are we, you know, what's our future going to be? Um, so, uh, you know, sharing those, those things uh, internationally is another aspirational goal I have down the road. Wow, thank you for sharing those. Um, and it's great to hear of the international partnerships that um, you have and that you are hoping to um, kind of further in, in the years to come. So um, yeah, looking forward to seeing more about that. And um, I did, uh, there is actually one more question. Um, is there any way that young people can get involved in, the, in an organization like Jack.org? Or is there any advice you can prov provide for people wanting to make a meaningful career where they can make a difference? Uh, yeah, so, so you know, I've, I haven't touched on it in this context, but uh, young people wanting to get involved are hugely welcomed into Jack.org. So, for example, if you're at a high school or a post-secondary and you just want to get involved, uh, the first thing to do is uh, check in on our website and see if they have a chapter. And if they don't have a chapter yet, and this will give you an example of how much more work there is to do. Um, uh, I won't ask you to guess, but I had no idea how many high schools there were in Canada. Uh, but you know, I mentioned that we're active in almost a couple hundred schools across the country. There are 3,400 high schools. Last oh time I looked up. Wow, okay, that's, so, that's huge. <laughs> Just think about that, right? Yeah. So there's a, a, there's still lots of schools where this just is not on the radar. Um, and so if you happen to be at one of those schools, and you know, it reminds me of one uh, uh, lovely young person uh, who, who connected with me when she was only in grade seven. <laughs> and our work starts in grade, because it's leadership focused, we've made a decision to start it in grade nine through post-secondary, really to age 20, 24, 25, um, but uh, she was very passionate. She had lived with some of her own struggles and I met with her. She actually came to the office and, uh, and uh, I told her, the, I think she was almost done grade seven, but um, I said, as soon as you're in grade nine, reach back out to me. And she did. And she started a chapter at her high school, literally when she was in grade nine. And I thought that was so cool. Yeah. But you can start a Jack chapter or join your Jack chapter. If you're inclined, you don't need to be already a great public speaker. But if you're if you're interested in learning more about how to be a, a, a good speaker, and as I mentioned, this is a great skill to have for anybody, um, you can uh, apply to become a, a trained 
and certify a Jack Talk speaker. Uh, in that case, originally we used to do it at a high school and post-secondary age, but um, we've learned it makes more sense to have the Jack Talks. The audience is high schools largely, but also post-secondary uh, age. But the speakers, because they have to travel around, um, it's worked out best that they're 18 and up, uh, you know. So uh, Jack Talks, uh, um, and also, you know, the, the summits, the summits program is, is, is open, uh, you know, at the local level, it's usually one high school who invites the local high schools in their area to create a local event, local Jack Summit. Um, but you can either join a Jack Summit or you can, you know, potentially even contact us to start one up and the team supports those young people to do all of these things, right? Um, and then the other thing is, you know, frankly, just share what we do, you know, whether you're an adult or, or you're passionate about it, maybe you're too busy because your, your, your schooling just has you overwhelmed or you're a varsity athlete or something, but you can still just share what's going on. And then from a personal point of view, I think checking out the Be There resource and, you know, what does it take to take two or three hours to go through the Be There certificate? That's not a huge commitment. And it can be transformational in terms of what you'll know about mental health. Um, and uh, so be there certificate.org or be there.org are great resources. Those are things that you can do. Um, we're, we're, you know, we've been growing a lot. So you talk about in their career, a lot of our young people have actually shifted their whole focus and have decided to go into the mental health space. And that might be, you know, uh, I can, I could, I can quote you examples of people who shifted, they've been in med school, but they've shifted their focus to go more towards psychiatry, for example. Um, we're, you know, we don't have jobs for everybody, but we're, we're hiring, we hire, I think they've already been hired for this summer, but we hire paid interns in the summer. Um, you know, young people who are passionate about this can keep their eye on our job postings. Uh, but there's other great organizations as well, right? There's like the kids help phones of the world. There's there's a new area in youth mental health called uh, integrated youth services that's just starting to get going. It's really active in BC now with an organization called Foundry, uh, and it's just getting going in Ontario, uh, in Manitoba, and a couple other provinces, uh, Alberta, um, with different branding in each one. But uh, those are other ways to get involved. So if it's if it's not going to be formally as a you know. Uh, a doctor or psychiatrist, psychologist, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's other ways that you can participate uh, in the sector. Uh, and, uh, you know, anybody who wants to reach out, I'd be happy to uh, uh, sort of uh, point them in that direction. Uh, the other way we often say people can, uh, one thing that we're so pleased with our community, this is another way they can support uh, and engage with jack.org. Each year we have over a hundred third party fundraisers. So these are people who, who want to get involved and help. And obviously, you know, raising funds for jack.org um, can, can be very helpful. Um, and it's amazing. Uh, we have, for example, this summer, one, a young woman who's, I think about 23, 24, um, she's making an attempt to swim across Lake Ontario and Lake Erie to raise funds for jack.org. We have another guy who is actually lives with a disability and he is very passionate about mental health. And uh, he is looking to paddleboard. He's a paddleboarder, but he lives with a, 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 a disability and he is looking to paddleboard across all five Great Lakes uh, <laughs> this summer. Um, and those are just two sort of pretty big examples, but some people just, you know, are, uh, they're turning, uh, you know, these are adults, they're turning 50, and they don't want any presents, but they just say, please support my charity. So some of them are much more, you know, uh, uh, basic in that way, but they're still really a, a way to engage their community uh, in the work of Jack.org and raise some funds. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways you can support, but just really sharing what we do with your community and pointing people in the direction of some of those resources is, is super helpful. Well, thank you so much. And I um, talking to you has been so amazing. And my brother's in high school. So I'm going to actually text him right after this call and be like, 
look it up, see if there's a chapter at your school. I'm sure he'd love to get involved. He's had his own struggles. So um, I think that this would be a great place for him to, to be and make a community around himself. So that's what I'm going to do right after this call. <laughs> well, that's terrific. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, just related to that, um, on average, young males are less inclined to get involved in these conversations. And, uh, you know, it's uh, always inspiring to me to see uh, young males reach, reach out. And uh, some of our chapters have actually been started up by, uh, one of the university chapters is started up by uh, male varsity athletes, believe it or not. And, uh, but that can be super engaging because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's obviously fantastic to have tons of young women involved in the programs, but young males are a little bit at higher risk. Uh, and, and, and really, uh, it's an important topic because they've just been grown up to be, you know, man up, toughen up, all that sort of nonsense, um, when you really should be opening up about, you know, something that's this important. And it is, you know, it's the, it's the biggest health issue for young people. It's still the leading health-related cause of death is suicide for young people. And, that's got to change. And we're just trying to do our part, trying our best. Thank you so much, by the way, for... No, thank you. We're so grateful to have you on the call today. Yeah, th thank you so much, Eric. This was so great chatting with you. And we'll be sure to share all the resources that you, that you mentioned as well. So thank you so much for taking the time. All right. Well, thank you. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thanks for all that you're doing.